artificial intelligence, blockchain, edge computing, virtual uh, assistants. You've been hearing all about these things in the last hour or couple of hours, and you might feel as if change is in the air. And that is certainly true, but I thought I would give you some perspective. Who here in the audience remembers owning that green metal tab on the far right in the top row? I'm so happy that no one raised their hands because that is from the early 1900s when department stores would give these out to customers so that they could track credit. Their names and the actual credit amount was written in ink. Uh, and since then, this industry has seen many, many disruptions, both in terms of how credit risk loans are underwritten, uh, the business processes, even down to the form factor of the credit cards that are issued. That lowly ATM sandwiched between two New York City buildings that you see up there may not look like much to you today, but it was a huge disruptor back in 1967 when Barclays first installed it in one of its banks in London. And what it did was forever change the relationship of a bank to its customer. And it changed it because no more was it face-to-face, -face, intimate, and frequent, but rather it became, there, there became a layer of technology between that relationship of those two entities. Today, the cell phone is much like uh, that ATM of 1967, where it's disrupting how we communicate with the financial institutions we have a relationship with, and how those institutions communicate back with us. The point of this slide really is not so much to say that, hey, disruption's always been there in this industry, but really to say what's different now and why we feel there is this change in the air is because it's the pace of disruption which has changed dramatically. And what is adding to that feeling of change is also the rise of the fintechs itself. I thought I would talk a little bit about how, that, how those fintechs have come about in an industry which has been very difficult to break into until the very recent past. Obviously, it is assisted by the rise of disruptive tech. And what it does is, and I'm going to use specifically machine learning and artificial intelligence here as an example, and the, and the reason why this is important here is because these companies can now meet the unmet needs of the customer um, by using these disruptive tech. And what's interesting is to see how cloud providers, some of whom you've heard uh, in the last hour or so, have really lowered the bar for admittance and usage of this disruptive tech by commoditizing machine learning and artificial intelligence. That, combined with open banking, open banking is a finance technology term. It really means use of open source technology to build APIs that third party developers can then use. May not sound like much, but this is like creating the iOS on top of which other apps are built for banks. And that combined lastly with a major global trend, which is global spend moving from the physical, this is cash, to the virtual, this is through digital payments. These three things together have, for this particular industry, really changed the paradigm for financial uh, startups, uh, fintech, to really come up. And now what you also notice is a lot of financial institutions, the established ones, are beginning to form deep relationships with these very fintechs. Nearly 80% of them now have these relationships. What is interesting for me as an observer and as a participant in this industry is that 70% of leaders in financial services, when they are polled uh, about disruptive tech, they say it is a concern for them, and that is because traditionally this industry has adopted uh, technology which is very mature, but now they are, they are adopting technologies which they still consider perhaps in their maturity cycle relatively early on. And you might wonder, what, why are they adopting it? Why are they racing to outdo each other when adopting these technologies? And that's really because of you, the customer. Customers are increasingly looking for personalization in real time. 75% of you, when polled, say that your loyalty to a brand that is able to raise the bar for, expect uh, bar for experiences and is able to do so in real time will win your loyalty. And that, when you couple it with things like 54% of you also say that your trust in financial institutions it's hard for these institutions to get your trust. And, and think about how companies can react to some ask like this from customers, which is, hey, I want personalization. I want you to do things that are uniquely for me. And I want you to understand me and solve my problems. I want you to do this in real time. And then how exactly will companies do this? Well, 
Let me give you an example, things like edge computing. Today, financial service companies are looking at edge compute, not because they are very savvy in the use of edge compute, but because that is how they deliver that trust, as in they deliver the privacy, which builds the trust. And this is how they actually are able to build and deliver that personalization, which is contextual and it's real time. So how has American Express tried to um, really use these technologies in its own uh, premises? Before I do that, let me kind of give you a sense of what an average Amex customer looks like. Today, 70% of all new customers that we onboard, they will be digitally engaged from the first month of onboarding. Of the active accounts, 78% will continue to be digitally active throughout their life cycle. What this has meant for us is that we have really reimagined what a customer's journey would look like when they're engaging with us on this digital channel. And obviously, we're moving away from, hey, how do I get you uh, your payments through to how do I actually help you in other aspects of your life? So today, if you were trying to plan a vacation, well, you can use Mezzi to actually plan your vacation. And then once you are on your vacation and you're at the airport, you can use LoungeBuddy to figure out which lounges have less traffic and where should you go and chill before you actually head out for your vacation. Let's say you're on that vacation, we send you contextual information to help you enjoy your vacation better, but then you want to find restaurants that are more suited to your tastes, use Resi to reserve tables in restaurants. In fact, our recent acquisition of Pocket Concierge in Japan means that our customers are now able to get into Michelin star equivalent restaurants within the, with, a, with a notice of just a few hours. We've also used automation with, along with machine learning to automate hundreds of processes in the back end, thereby changing the experience of our customers. If you are a customer today in certain parts of the world, we verify your ID, not manually, but using computer vision. If you are a merchant, we service you today. When you email us with a question or a query about your account, we don't take days. It takes us much less because we look through the email to figure out the intent, the nature of the question that has been raised in the email and direct it to a service queue automatically. If you are, um, if you are you know, in the commercial business, we've, we've done heavy automation of our accounts payable platform such that spending limits are updated automatically depending on how you're doing and what we anticipate your needs to be. This is not reactive, but rather proactive automation. And as an example, that has led to a 43% increase in Amex spend of these merchants with us. With 110 trillion Amex cards in circulation, our networks process about a trillion dollars every single year. And that means that we have 25% of the US credit card activity uh, share that is, part of, um, that is part of American Express. So you must have definitely gotten the message that I'm trying to give here, which is we are a company that's focused on the digital. But it's not just limited to you know, uh, uh, planning your vacation, or, or beyond that, it's also a lot about how you talk to us, what is your dialogue with us, and how are we servicing you. And we do so today with a variety of apps. You could use Alexa, you could install a skill in there and talk to us and ask us about benefits in your reward program. Um, we've partnered with fintechs like PayPal, Venmo, and that, that allows our customers to do peer-to-peer -peer payments or payments to other PayPal merchants, not just through the actual use of dollars, but even your points, if that's what you want to do. We've used blockchain, yes, we've used blockchain, not just for uh, cross-border payments like a lot of other financial institutions, uh, like some of what the previous speakers were talking about. We've been experimenting and playing and thinking about how else can we uh, positively change the user experience and the customer experience. And recently, we announced a partnership with Boxed. And it fundamentally changes how our reward programs work. That's because if you look at traditional credit card reward programs, they are at a merchant level, which means we might say things like 3% cash back for all spend in restaurants. But with partnerships like the ones that we just talked about with Boxed, which are powered by the blockchain, it allows us to give you reward programs or reward points at a product level. We're experimenting even more. In fact, we want to think about how do we reward our customers, not just for the transaction. 
which is what's traditionally done, but even for activity. So everything I've talked about so far really is about what's happening today in the industry, or perhaps in the next 12 to 24 months, where customers are looking for and financial institutions are looking to give these customers a seamless experience that is personal. It doesn't require effort on part of the customer itself to get what they need to do, and it's all real time, it's contextual. But you may ask, well, what's going to happen beyond that two-year horizon? And I hesitate, because very famous men and women in their areas of expertise have been really wrong about when predicting what the future of their industry might look like. But I can't help myself, so I will still try to make some predictions. And I think everything we've talked about here is, is really cool, but if you look at Asia, that's where I see some real excitement in how financial services industries is headed. Specifically, I'll, I'll sort of call out WeChat, which is not just what everything I've talked about talks about how you go from being a payments provider to more relevant in the lives of your customers, but WeChat is like a combination of a Facebook, a Grubhub, a Venmo, a Messenger, a WhatsApp, and payments all rolled into one app. And that experience and the experience it gives to its customers is dramatically different than anything we see today in the West. And, and I think that our industry and its use of AI will increasingly move in that direction. But really, if I think about um, how financial services might evolve where we are today, we have to look no further than what you, the customer, is looking for. Because ultimately, that is what drives our, the companies in the space to build, experiment, and solve for. So thank you for your time.